Hi there, and welcome to Get Good. We are going to be talking about gear in this video. Uh, we were chatting with our, our wider, wonderful community on our Discord and uh, decided that a gear video would be a good way to go after our lovely Dante video. So uh, thank you to all of our wonderful community members. Uh, Magnus, it is morning here, so a very good morning to you. How are you doing? It is good morning. It's morning here too. <laughs> that is that is the sound of someone who's had a bit of a rough night, but that's okay. No, it's okay. It, this one wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay, so we have... We have picked a gear list. Um, we're not going to, I, I, at first I thought we we're going to put them in tiers. Uh, then I thought that was an insane thing to do. We basically picked the gear that we like in the hobby. Um, but I think maybe a good thing for us to do at the end of each piece, sorry, I'm, I'm really throwing this on you right now, uh, is um, we we maybe say how much money is a good amount to throw into it. Not Not like a figure, but there are some items I think that you can get a cheap one and it's fine. And some items yeah. that maybe you want to spend a bit more money on because you're going to be using it every day, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I agree. Right. I, and I, I only know what the first item is um, and the rest is going to be a surprise to both of us. And the, and it is my absolute favorite uh, image I've ever found. So it's magnificent. Oh, that's a, yeah. <laughs> now, this man is beaming light from his magical <laughs> eye goggles onto his little toy airplane but essentially magnification whether it's the the sexy goggles or um a, a light with a magnifying what do you so what mags th this is this is your pick i think initially um yeah what do you want to say about magnification um i can't when i when i gave you my picks i um i kind of gave them uh how I thought they were in, in importance. Uh, so this one is not the first one for me in importance, but it's something I cannot really, I mean, I can, but it is important for me now uh, because um, for the longest time I didn't use any magnification. Then I tried um, the, the, the lamp one with the magnification on top. I actually have one on my desk and I used it a bit and was, uh, it didn't really fit my style of painting and the, the whole, it was just awkward looking through it and then uh, having something under. So you had to kind of like space uh, correctly on, bo on both sides of, uh, of the magnification. So for me that, uh, I know some people who actually use it to produce, um, but for me, it wasn't very good. Um, which meant I actually kind of, went off the idea of magnification completely for quite quite a while. Uh, and I cannot remember where, but uh, some talking about it and someone threw a link and, and, whew, and someone throws a link, <laughs> you better know I... So it's dangerous. It. Yeah. So of course I pressed it and looked through and I was like, ah, I mean, it's not, it costs some money. But it, it, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I have magnification and they are not great quality, but uh, they really, really help. Uh, I did a bit of uh, inside padding because in the beginning, I also kind of got headaches uh, having them on for extended periods. But if you put a bit of foam padding or whatever inside them, um, that's not a problem for me now. And I want to say it definitely definitely leveled up my painting hmm. quite significantly um cleaner cleaner lines all over and, and it means i can do much much less of uh, actual glazing because now it's easier for me to see the transitions uh even closer so um i can kind of blend going back and forth between colors using the uh, translucency of those to blend out instead of having to do a broad stroke and relying on like the slow effect taking hold, I guess. Yeah. So for me, this one is very, very, very nice. It is not like a mandatory one. I, I mean, not, none of them are, but I have a few that are <laughs> quite close to mandatory. This one isn't, but I will say it is probably in my top three or something like that. It's, yeah. uh, I use it every day. Uh, I paint on every piece. I don't use it all the time on 
uh, on the pieces. If if I'm throwing a, a base code or uh, doing an initial highlight or something, uh, and if it's a bigger model, I don't use it. But for in any kind of refinement, I use it. And I go anywhere from one times magnification up to two and a half magnification. And uh, I comfortably sit at around. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Put them I, on for, for your piece. Yeah. I, uh, I comfortably sit around two times uh, magnification. Uh, I have, uh, and as I said, I just put a bit of uh, foam inside to not get the headaches. And, and I said before, this is not good quality. It's even, it, it even broke and I just uh, pinned it and uh, taped it and whatever. So for me, this is a, a even a cheap one is was well, really that's like a, nice a rite of passage, isn't it? In the, in the, in the hobby is like Jerry rigging some sort of like, um, <laughs> like goggle solution together. But I mean, as you can see, I'm a little bit of a goggles freak. I think this is my third pad. There. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that works yeah. quite well. Um, I, and I think I actually have had so many of these just like from a comfort point of view, because I think I started oh, with the, these, which are like a three times magnification. Um, mm -hmm. and these are very close to the eyes. And I think that's the one thing I'd say is if you want to get into magnification goggles, just with how light works, it means you have to hold the, the model closer to your face. Yeah. Um, and depending on the magnifications, like these are three and a half times that can be really uncomfortable if you're trying to get certain bits. Yeah. So I think th this is kind of my sweet spot, which is like two and a half times. And it's like, yeah. it's far enough away that you don't have to feel like you're, you're getting uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know, uh, mine are probably like seven centimeters from the eye. Uh, that means with the two times magnification, I'm going uh, 20 centimeters from or something like that, maybe 25. Uh, so there is a sweet spot. You can't just go 12 times magnification. Well, you can, but you're... You can. To... I, I can do that. And it, let me tell you, it did not help me paint an eye. No, it, it, it's, sadly it is not. possible, but you, but it's just, you have to hold the, the mini so close that it, it's not a, an advantage at all. So you kind of have to find your own sweet spot. And as I said, between one and two and a half is, is uh, what I work with. And I, and I want to say, even with a one times magnification of one and a half, uh, it will uh, help you massively. Uh, one thing is seeing, but another thing actually is uh, it really helps with brush control because now you're really trying to paint uh, within the lines of something very small. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of forcing yourself to um, like have even more, I guess, steady hands and brace even more and being even more precise because you can see everything. And uh, so it helped me with, yeah, both cleaner lines and blends and brush control in general. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know you said it's not required, like none of it's required, but if you really want to get no. crunchy into details, I'd say definitely check them out. Um, yeah. Maybe like don't spend a lot of money. Like, no, it doesn't matter. It, yeah. Some like, like go on Amazon or any, any of your local cheap online retailer or your local yeah. hobby store. I mean, they tend to be a bit more expensive, but. Just pick a set, yeah, pick, see if they suit you, and, and give it a go. Yeah, I I, I agree. I agree. You don't right. have to dump a lot of money into it, but this one is a good one to put some cash into. Yeah. Right now, now I don't know. This could be anything. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, three D printer. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate this, this one is going to be made. Yeah, this is me. You do, you don't have a three D printer, do you? No, I don't. So I mean, I did the classic thing of. Um, I'm new into the hobby. Um, I want to throw a lot of money into it because I'm, I'm an idiot, um, and just like spending money sometimes. Um, and I get through like the, the first few of my purchases, I start painting, I start having fun. I thought I'm going to buy a 3d printer because I'm going to save money. This is what I told myself. I'm going to save money in the long run because I'm, I'm giving all this money to games workshop, but if, but resin's cheap and you can just get models online and that'd be great. Um, that none of that panned out at all um for, <laughs> no. for two reasons like uh, as i said in uh my video on uh on volume ooh, uh, using blender um finding games workshop models and 3d printing them is super legal do not do that that is naughty um but there is 
there is something to be said about the the skill that is that it takes to to craft good miniatures and games workshop are very good at it and there are a lot yeah. of incredibly talented people online who are doing sculpting but there's a reason why games workshop is hiring essentially a lot of the best people um so th there's kind of like that implicit question of like well then why include this and i would probably say with how it's changed for me in terms of i will buy my figures um the the ones i love from like small spike like small resin shops i think there's one like slightly off frame here um all the way up to games workshop but the reason that the 3d printer has become such a useful tool for me is anything to do with basing if i have an yeah. idea for something i want to base i can mm -hmm. grab the files 3d print it and have it ready to go in seconds and that feels yeah. pretty special at times yeah i agree um, it is it is also very good for uh doing small conversions if you mm -hmm. want a different head or if you want a hand holding a sword instead of an axe or stuff like that it is very nice for that okay yeah. and, and i'm i'm not a i'm not a green stuff pro i'm not a I'm only put pro um sure. but there is something like oh okay well i can just find them like a similarly I, I know 3d software so sometimes i can even make stuff myself and 3d printer mm -hmm. um i will say 3d printers are getting cheaper but it's still a lot of money and the resin is super toxic and not particularly fun so uh, it's probably only something you really want to get into if you're super passionate about it um but if it is something that you're thinking oh i wish i had these basing bits or something like that it is a good thing to, to look at potentially i agree that it's it, that's actually mainly the reason why i don't have one is uh we have small kits and I don't have a dedicated uh, room for hobbying that I can close the door and yeah. ventilate and all of those things. So it, for me, it's not going to happen for like only the application of doing basing and stuff like that. Uh, I'll hit up a friend if if I need something. Just say, uh, just say me. But, I'll, I'll send it to demo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, right. and, and yeah. it is Sorry, a lot go. of money to put. It, yeah, yeah, and and I agree, it is a lot of money to put into something. That, I mean, some people get one and really get into it. I guess, um, put tons and tons of models and have fun with it and uh, try all the the different settings and and the quality is getting so good now. Uh, I remember some years ago, a friend of mine got a. Um, not even a resin 3d printer but one of the filament ones yeah. and it could make minis it could make uh, it was good for terrain especially for terrain uh very 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 nice he used it for dungeon and dragons but whatever it's the same um but but uh, and we tried to make some minis on it and it was the quality was just not good enough for me after the sculpt when it came out but now they are getting extremely good actually if people have a quality one and know what they're doing they are getting very good yeah no so it's, so it's, it's a usable it, tool yeah if you want to get crunchy about it go for it but yeah. this is probably one this of those is, things this is in the top tier of nerdiness i think <laughs> yeah yeah this is like yeah. how you know you've spent way too much money on on the on the hobby yeah right next painting handles yes go for it mag you <laughs> tell me yeah, I mean, I've, I've. This is a controversial one. We need some hot takes here. Just good. Um, personally, I think it is unneeded. I, yes, I think it is unneeded. You're gonna make I people so mad is, here. I like this. Yeah, I am. I think this is a luxury thing. Yeah, I'm even. I can even. I'm think. looking. I'm looking for my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think this is this is really a luxury thing. Uh, you can hold a mini with uh, cork or with the, I have an, an old paint pot with just some blue tag on it and stuff like that. Eh, some people don't like the blue tag thingy because it can fall off and I mean, but so I, I want to say in my opinion, this one is unneeded, but it is for some people very comfortable because if you sit down and, um, paint for a long time, having something that is better economical than this can help you not having to take a break because of your fingers cramping or whatever. So it, 
for me at least, it is a luxury thing. Unneeded, but they are not incredibly expensive. So you, it is a gear thing you can you can have and you can get use of. This is yeah. This is my take on it. Yeah. And I think, I, I think you're only wrong, Magnus. Huh? I think I think you're full of crap. I think I think yeah. you're absolutely wrong. I, so you know when you're starting off, cork, bit of pen, brilliant, works a treat. Yeah. Um, the reason I've perhaps got a bit more crunchy about my painting handles is, I think I, I'm one of those people that has shoulder injuries from like old rugby stuff, which which like doesn't help. And so like that level of comfort in the arm is quite um, useful. But I've become such a um, a fan of like so I have the Rathcore thing in my hand and just this idea mm -hmm. of something that goes over the top of what I'm painting and like helps me angle things in weird places without yeah. me needing to put my arm in weird places. I'm a big fan of. Um, so I do like uh, the Rathcore stuff um, and like yeah, and it also lets you like rest your finger, brace your fingers on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yourself. Yeah. So. Yeah. So like there's the the snake rot fiddle and it's, and it's like uh -huh. this this is a larger one so i can i can handle it and then like mm -hmm. put put my fingers where i need to be without ever touching the model so like i think the only thing that would make me recommend people get a painting handle more than saying just use like cork is typically they're not that much money so it doesn't feel no, too exactly. bad yeah i mean they don't even make I, the I... citadel one anymore do they so this is the wrong image to 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 <laughs> uh, i I actually agree in the sense that um, it it can help you. It can be something for comfort. So, and, and they are not expensive. So, I mean, if you want to try it out, try one out. Or, you know, you you can ask some friends what they have a good experience with, and then figure out. Okay, maybe because. Also, there is no real benefit from you sitting hours and getting cobbled down because you're just clenching your fist. So, it's, I mean, as I said, it's not a necessary one at all, but the investment is very small. So if you're already thinking, eh, maybe it could be something for me, definitely just try it out. And soon you will be finding yourself with 10. Yeah, and, and I think maybe the only thing I'd say, I mean, 10 is... 10 is small numbers, Magnus. We've got to pump those. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the main thing is like, definitely have a handle. Like, do not be one of those people who are kind of getting your sweaty hands all over your model or, or like no, trying no, no, to no, get no. the bottom of the base. Like, get something, even if it is just an old paint pot or a cork, because it's just going to make it more enjoyable to paint. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What is next? Hobby knife. Hobby knife. Yes. Very important. I have mine right here. Yes. It um, is uh, go on. an exacto knife. Knife is uh, mandatory. Yes, you will. You will need it. <laughs> um, yeah, you need something sharp to cut with and scrape with, and you, yeah, you cannot go without. This is one of the things where, yeah, you just can't go without. You can't go without it. It doesn't cost a lot of money. No. Um, the thing I will say, like, in terms of giving people advice, is if like you're buying your hobby knife, brilliant buy blades buy a lot of blades yeah. um yes. i made this mistake i was using the same blade for like months and being like why is it so hard to remove mold lines or like why is this like a nightmare to cut it's like because the blade is dull and you need to swap yes. it out like quite often yeah. it turns out yeah. um more often than you think yeah 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 way more often i and like yeah. typically the way i do it now is if i'll do like a a, a single model i'll use one blade on a project and then i'll swap mm -hmm. it out Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, like, even then, like, I know people that, like, do a blade a day because they're lunatics. But, like, as soon as it starts feeling like there's resistance in the cut, you might want to consider getting a new blade in. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and also, you really don't want to use force when you're... Because the, the mounts are very fragile, so you don't want to use any force. So it it, uh, it should be uh, very sharp for you to... Yeah. Uh, I, do the, I do the clipping like a rough clipping and then I remove uh, like from the model with a knife. Yeah. So I don't, because uh, clipping all the way into the model, sometimes you can clip into uh, the sculpt itself. Yeah, and, and people put a lot of stock into like expensive clippers, um, but I think it was um, 
Phoenix, who watching one of um, his videos is basically like, look, yeah. flip away, use the model knife to get in close. And yes. that's, that's what I've adopted. And like, yeah, you can have cheap clippers. I think that's fine because you're going to be using your hobby knife and your yeah. blade to be accurate to get the yeah. model off the sprue. Yeah, I completely agree. It is definitely the way to go. The clipper is not a, at all important. Not to me, at least. No, not at all. Right. Yeah. Pain rack. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Completely I mean, mandatory it, to me. What do you? Yeah, think? it is. It is to you, and it is not at all to me. Uh, you wouldn't believe how I stole my paints. Not in I a think, I, I, think I, would. I think I would. I think I would. I think it, I'd be really sad about it. Yeah, you. You don't want to look at it. I, <laughs> I have to kind of like. I. I generally pick out what I'm using for a project in the beginning having an idea and yeah, then two weeks in, I just have 50 bottles of whatever stacked and I have so much paint. It's incredible. And I'm still looking for more because it's exciting, but it's just, yeah, not you're, at all. You're an absolute monster. This is awful. Yeah. I, I unfortunately am it's uh, but it, also the rack for me, uh, because my projects are extended. Hmm. which means I would kind of need, uh, I could have racks for like organizing within colors or ranges or whatever, but then I would need a rack for like the project because I take a bit from here, a bit from there, a bit from like that. And I, as I said, I think I have, yeah, I almost want to show it. it don't, don't show it. We don't want to drive away the viewers. I, I think, you no, know, I think I have 40 paints on my, on my desk right now just all kinds of stuff for all kinds of recipes and yeah so, so yes it is if you're not if you're not a lunatic if you're not a slicker <laughs> like it is, so, it is so very 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 nice for organization yeah you have, uh, I have my reds it's, together yeah, 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 yeah. it's wonderful and and actually i yeah. do what you alluded to that so like when i have a project i'll pick paints for the project and i'll put them in a separate rack so i know that they're yeah. the ones in use um yeah like i know this is a very like crunchy way of organizing things and that that's like my personal preference because i like my life very structured um <laughs> but there is there is something about saying okay here's everything i have to work with i'm going to pick paints from there and i can identify gaps so like i was thinking about an ultramine project the other day oh. i was looking at the rack and i was like i actually don't have a blue i'm happy with i should probably go add something to it um yeah the problem is is you then keep buying paints because you like paints too much but that's i think that's a universal problem in the hobby yeah, it definitely is. I have hundreds of different paints and yeah, mo so, uh, maybe not most, but uh, I, I think almost half of it, I probably even haven't tried. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that was a quick one. I think, I think. Yeah, it, but I, but I agree, it, especially if you have a dedicated hobby space. Yes. Get them. You can get cheap ones and it does not really matter which, I mean, if you like the look of some, get them. Uh, and it's not like you have to change them because I mean, they don't take anywhere, <laughs> yes. but yeah, so get them and get organized. I completely agree. They are, especially for a dedicated outer space, I not mandatory, but they are borderline. Yeah. And I'd just be maybe a little bit cautious on like anything that's ultra cheap, just because the last thing you want to do is go to yeah. the hobby space and find paints everywhere. Um, because the, like the, the, the cabinets collapsed or something. So. Like, yeah, you can get some looks decent. Yeah, some cardboard ones that are really not great. No, laser cut wood. It's a good way to go. Yeah. Right. Airbrush. Yeah. Uh, I don't use an airbrush and I never have. Uh, I could probably because it is Airbrushes. possible to put it up anywhere and don't have overspray and all of those things. Um, I haven't gotten into it. If I had a dedicated hobby room, it would probably be the next thing for me to get, because I think, uh, it is a skill in itself, learning how to use an airbrush, uh, especially if you want to use it, uh, not only in the beginning or in the end of the project, but also like during, mm -hmm. uh, that is very very difficult and something you need to train but i think you can 
um, like refined a lot of things and cut some corners time wise. Uh, generally, an airbrush can do the same things as a brush, but there are things where it's not true. Um, and yeah, it, it would it would probably be the next thing for me to get if I had a dedicated piece. Yeah, and like, be. I don't want to harp on about airbrushes because I think there's a lot to say. I'd say like my journey into airbrushing, like I have two here. Mm -hmm. Um, the first I bought after watching the Zamikito video on airbrushing, I think he's got some really mm -hmm. good videos on that, which is basically like, hey, buy a cheap one uh, and give it a go. And cheap, cheap is an in inverted commas here because the airbrush was like 20, 20 pounds in the UK, but the compressor mm -hmm. was like a hundred. And so like, yeah. there is no, like, there is no small amount that works really. Like you, it's, it is an investment. Um, but like this thing, this it's cheap, it's great. Um, and and basically this is what I use for priming. Um, I don't yeah. typically try not to use rattle can just because you have a lot more control with an airbrush priming. Um, yeah. And if I'm if I'm airbrushing metallics like TMM, which is like pretty rare, um, but is something I do, I'll use this cheap one. Um, so like for example, mm -hmm. I have a dreadnought I'm working on. I'm going to prime that with the airbrush. I'm going to get the metallics on with an airbrush. Um, then I have this harder and steam bag, which is like a 200 pound airbrush. And mm -hmm. you notice the difference. I will say that this controls yeah. better. It is way more accurate, but ultimately I, the more I've kind of got into miniature painting, the more I go back to the brush over the airbrush, because the, there is stuff that you can accomplish with an airbrush that you can't really accomplish with a brush. Like you can get a particular type of blending, which is nearly impossible. Um, but like anything else you really have to like worry like you really have to like stress over a little bit yeah i agree i completely agree and if you really want to get into like airbrushing uh an expensive one is obviously the way to go but but feeling out with the cheap one is probably the way to go for most because you might find out uh, this is actually not really for me at all. <laughs> uh, so having a an ex very expensive one for only putting down a base coat and or a bit of light or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. Not to me. The investment is too big. Yeah. yeah. Hobby light. Yes. This was. I Hobby think. Light. I think this was a you for you for this, uh, Mags. What do you yeah. think? important very important you don't want to have uh, bad lighting you can't see the details and you'll be straining your eyes against it and uh, when you take your model it away from the from the painting table it won't look good i think it is extremely important if you're just army painting in your living room sure it's okay with whatever light you you have on hand, mm. but if you're doing anything at a higher standard, you need a a good hobby light. Yeah, and it can be, uh, I, I'd say, uh, a bright one on the colder side is the one at least I go with, um, and often I will turn on the like the normal living room light because it gives a bit more of a yellow light too. And so it looks a bit more like it would in, in I guess, bright daylight because you can get a, a bit of a blue cold light. And uh, so the colors will change a bit, but uh, th that is much better than not being able to see the details. And yeah, yeah. I think this is uh, very important and it, they don't have to be expensive and they don't just that you have something you can angle and gives a lot of light and like the the broader the light cone the better because you will have more illumination and having your uh, hands get in the way i've seen some of those uh, like the curved um, yeah, yeah. lights yeah which uh, which look great because you can kind of like make a shadow from your hands or your head or whatever it is uh, currently i'm actually even using two lights because then I can kind of shine from more than one angle. Yeah. So it's super illuminated. Yeah, I think it is important. Very important. 
I think if you cannot if you cannot see the model, you can't paint it, and you need the light no, to, no, to no. do it ultimately. And like yeah. when you go, when you're talking with some of the details that you'll see on models, you need to blast light into that space. Like you know, yeah. that's something we do a lot in video production is like understanding you have to really light something to see it. And the same yeah. principle when you're working in miniature, you you really have to do that. So, yeah. um, I, I agree. Like start cheap. But yeah. don't start with a light that's like really warm um, because that's really going to mess up your colors. Like try and get something that is essentially daylight. Um, but that, yeah. that's reasonably cheap nowadays, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. Brush. Yes. And I, I think for the sake of argument, mm. we all know you need brushes to paint, but this is maybe yeah. the premium sable hair, like the expensive brushes. Yeah. Um, this is another one where I'm not saying mandatory, but it's kind of like the same with the, with the magnification lens, it will definitely level up your painting. Having a sharp tip on, uh, a, a, a tiny brush is going to be, um, much easier to make the, the details you want on a, on a model that is yeah very small. Details are getting smaller and smaller, and yeah, I, I think having a quality brush uh, really is important. I started out with the regular uh, Citadel and now we paint the brushes, and while it's fine to begin with to try stuff out and to, uh, I just, I could feel a, a very big difference getting a quality sable brush afterwards. Mm. Uh, so I changed uh, my brushes, I think four months in or something, uh, because I wasn't really satisfied with, I mean, the handling and the application of paint. Yeah. So for me, uh, not a mandatory, you can go with cheaper brushes if you want to, and synthetics are also fine, but if you want to level up, yeah, I think it's very important and you don't have to get 10 different brushes you can go a long ways with a size one and a size zero and a size maybe a size zero zero mm -hmm. you can go very far and if you don't use those for i mean i'm a monster so but if you don't do like i do and uh, only actually use them for the detail work they're intended to do uh, and use a cheap brush for base coating and mixing and Maybe putting down the, the the first layer and stuff like that, and then switching. Yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're not a monster, absolutely, you can. Exactly. You can if you're reasonable, monster. you you would do that, and you will get a ton of mileage from a quality quality brush, and uh, definitely hundreds of hours uh, if you take care of it. So, and, and like so speaking as someone that was like premium brush pilled from the get go, because like when I got into the <laughs> hobby, like I did what I think a lot of people do is I watched a load of videos and then got into mm. the hobby. Yeah. Um, and like I, I thought, well, I want to start with a sable brush. And so I started with Da Vinci um, mm -hmm. and, and had like and painted with it. It's a lovely brush, like really does the job. The thing I'd probably say, like if you're going to get into premium brushes is don't lock down and say, I'm going to use this brand. You, you might need to try something. And this is where it kind of gets a little bit, I wish I had the words to describe some things about brush control and usage, but nothing to me, and this is why I say like brushes are a really personal thing. To me, nothing feels like my Windsor and Newtons. That there's something about how they control, how they feel, like the paint goes where I want it to go that I've not felt with some other premium brushes. Whereas I, I know people who swear by artist Opras, who swear by Raphael, who swear by Da Vinci. Yeah, I'm a Raphael guy. Yeah. yeah, completely. And like, it's so like, it's not, it's not like, oh yeah, the highest of the high tiers is Winter and Nissan. I know people that love Rosemary and Co. Uh, and yeah. it's cheap <clears throat> and that's brilliant. Um, so it's, it's, it's making sure that like that is taken into account is you may not find your brand the first good brush you buy and that's okay. No. Um, but make sure you get as much mileage out of it as possible because they are. Yeah, of course. Like but when you need to change, you, you can change for. Sorry, w when you need to change your brush, anyways, you can change for something else. You can try another one, a Newton or, yeah, Rosemary and Co. or Artis Opus or Raphael or, or whatever it is. I, I mean, it's not always easy to get, like every brush in every country all over the world. For example. Uh, Raphael's are pretty easy to get a 
for me because they are actually sold locally. Hmm. Um, whereas uh, Winsor Newtons aren't, uh, which is probably one of the main reasons I stayed with those. Yes. Because I could go to the store, I could look at the brush, know it's not frayed, it looks like it should. I can get the brush, go home, be happy. So you don't run into the quality, the quality control missing something. And because there, there is no worse feeling than spending money on something expensive like a brush and then getting it in hand and it just, oh my God, it looks like, yeah, a toothbrush. It just doesn't work. It just feels. No, 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 no. So that's, that's probably my main reason, but I think. Uh, yeah, it is super important and, uh, all the top like brands will have different lengths of bristles. The body will be thicker or thinner and the snap will be like more or less. So yeah, you need to try out something to fit your style, I guess, of painting. You can adapt to the brush, of course, but if, if you feel something is off, it could be that you. You need to try a different, different one, yeah. maybe with a bigger value or whatever. Yeah. To me, are extra thin. This is a me thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna say this quickly because I think this is speaks to a larger thing. Like, I know people oh, because I've like I, I evangelize about the things I'm really passionate about, and um, I, I brought some people into the hobby, and a lot of things like oh, well, I need some super clear, and that's all I need. Um, and like something like a Tamir extra thin cement, it seems like such a like a minor thing, but it it, it shows a, an increased level of care in what you're putting together, um, and essentially like understanding the model is the canvas on which to paint, and you can use this mm -hmm. for sticking stuff it together. You can use it for cleaning up mold lines. You can use it to mm -hmm. make sprue goo if you're so inclined. Um, to me, it it shows like you're beginning to take the hobby more seriously. And it's one of those versatile things that just comes in a good applicator. It's really well made. It's really well packaged. Like this is my idea of hobby heaven is like un undoing the lid, getting that initial whiff of Tamir extra thin. I'm like, yeah, this is what we're doing now. Yeah. I actually, I actually, the trick I use for sometimes you can, when you stick a model together, you can get kind of a bit of like a gap. Hmm. And my go-to is actually when I put models together to use the not extra thin and Ooh, the, have enough. The, the regular to me. Yes. And then I have enough of it so that when I stick the model together, it just, you know, gets bubbles out the tiny, tiny bit. And then I quickly, quickly, quickly go with the Tamiya extra thin over the top of it because it, it basically smooths it out. The, the regular and, Tamiya. This is what was really... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This sounds yeah, stressful, it, Magnus. Like, No, because I just have both on the on the desk. And then when I put it together, it gets kind of like a... Instead of having a a, a line that is indented, you get a, a bit of Tamiya bubbling out. And then the extra thin can smooth it out super quickly. And you can sand on top of that so you don't have to fill... Afterwards. So I'm going to yeah. steal that idea. I like always, so always in my hobby desk, like when I'm, because I was putting together a dreadnought last night, I have the sprint yeah. glue and the extra thin. This is just, this is hobby heaven to me. Yeah. Right. It works for me at least. <laughs> We're at the last one. And I know there's only one thing left, uh, which is like the most important okay. thing, certainly for you. Um, was that, you mentioned the wet palette. Yeah. Um, this is another one that's, borderline a must you can paint with the tile i guess but if you want to do any advanced work this is a must um it's a must in the sense that get a wet palette or make one having a brand one is not necessary at all you can uh, i actually i think i painted for more than a year maybe one and a half year with a, with a homemade one, just a container, shallow container with a sponge in the bottom and some parchment paper on weight, parchment paper on top. Uh, and in the end, I just, I guess one, it's a branded one, but it is for, uh, mixing and for, um, 
like quickly thinning out something because almost all the time I go like in varying consistency and opacity uh, in like almost a fluid motion. Um, so you kind of get it on from the pot onto the wet pellet and you thin it a bit so it gets to like normal consistency and when I'm saying normal it really depends on the on the different paints but something like a milk consistency or something like that and then you can go from there very easily you can just put something on your brush uh, give it in a bit of uh, paint and then like drag it out and mix a bit more on the wet palette because it has a bit of moisture it will thin it down so maybe you go from like 60 40 paint to water very quickly you go to more like 40 60 and if you mix more and more and more it gets thinner and thinner and thinner so you can get like gradually towards a like real great glaze uh, consistency and uh, it is incredibly useful hmm. uh, incredibly so it takes some learning to uh to use it you you kind of want to figure out and it and this is different for people to how much water they want to put in how wet they want the paper and the paints because some people like to paint with like closer to pot consistency and some people yeah closer to glaze consistency this is also kind of like a, a style or or preference thing for individuals yeah. but when you start to like get into it and figure out how you like using the wet palette it is a tool i i couldn't be without yeah and, and I, like, I think as someone who's perhaps not as advanced in that painting journey as you <laughs> i do see the argument of like you don't you can do you can do a lot with like just understanding paint consistency um and like just using a standard palette a dry palette um, but as you get more advanced, as you want longer working times, as you want to think more about the paint that you're applying, I do think a wet palette becomes a necessity and, and yeah, they aren't I think. expensive. You can make your own. There's a million and one guides online. It's, it's well worth trying it yeah. out. Yeah. Right. Magnus, we are, we are nearly at time because, because we, we always come <laughs> these recordings in, um, there's, there's, a, there's a bonus round, um, which I think is just as important which is this magical can of Red Bull, yeah. Um, yeah. which I, I noticed you in the recording taking a sip of Red Bull. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're chasing a sponsorship, you kind of have to, right? That's it, absolutely. So like <laughs> any any highly caffeinated drinks, Red Bull obviously being king of king of caffeinated drinks. Um, I think that maybe like this is like, I would loop this into motivation. You know what motivates me is like feeling energized and happy to paint. And hey, if Red Bull gets you that, all the more power to you. Like, how? What? What's the? What's the sixty-second pre-paint primer from Magnus? Like, is it get that Red Bull in you and then just start painting? Yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, I'm probably not like most people, so uh, for me, it actually like calms my thoughts a bit, and actually even also calms my hands a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I kind of get more focused and it sounds a bit weird because it's a caffeinated sugar drink, but for me, it, it does. But if it is a, a nice cup of coffee or someone uh, posted a picture recently where I saw uh, their desk and their nice setup and you could see that they wanted to have a good time and get into it and they had a glass of wine on the side. So having your favorite beverage and uh, some people listen to a podcast and some people have like some music on or some people are in a phone call or whatever it is. And some people just sit there and listen to their own thoughts like the horrible own thoughts. That's <laughs> whatever it is. I, I think, uh, yeah, having like doing it as kind of a me time thing is important very important uh you should be enjoying every paint session and sometimes you feel like i think it's okay to feel like you have to force it to like sit down and get to it because busy lives and all that so it, for me it's it's uh, okay to kind of like have to force to get to the desk and 
sit down and get set up. But when you're there and you're painting, you should be enjoying it. Yeah. And if you don't, I think you should step away and say, okay, this is going to be another day. Yeah. Like I'd wrap that up in make your hobby space a place you want to be. Because if you don't want to be there, you, you're, you're trying to conquer way too many barriers to get there, ultimately. Yeah, it's not going to be fun. Right, well, Magnus, that is time. Thank you so much for your time and, and for sure yeah, sharing you. any thoughts. If you're watching this, thank you so much for watching this. Um, and that's all from us. Uh, keep tuned because we have a lot more videos coming out um, and hopefully and maybe an exciting Patreon launch in the near future. So thank you very much for watching. Have fun painting and keep getting good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.